Welcome to this new episode of The Context. Today I want to talk to you about collective intelligence. Really, uh, the starting point for this for me has been the global reverberation of news, scientific information, opinion around COVID-19, of course. We are part of a global learning exercise, epidemiology, molecular biology, understanding of the dynamics of the healthcare industry, sociology, behavioral science, and of course, politics and economics. All these fields are interacting and we are all daily analyzing how the pandemic and our desire to minimize the harm that it is causing to us and to human civilization globally can be handled. How can we make the best possible decisions? And since the pandemic is extending from one area to another, we can learn from the experience of a given geography and decide that what they did is the right thing to do and try to emulate it and implement it, or decide that what they are doing is not worth emulating in our conditions, either because what they did is wrong or because we live in a different situation ourselves. The first was, of course, China and uh, the type of uh, political organization and social rules meant that it was possible to impose very strict social distancing measures and to know that the vast majority of people would comply with those measures. And they have been successful, uh, even though they were unable to contain the infections, which is the reason that uh, we now have a global pandemic. Today, the number of new infections in their territory um, has stopped or has stopped in practice to the point that they are restarting uh, the economy. Uh, restarting production of industrial goods, restarting uh, the conversations with uh, clients and suppliers, and restarting the daily lives of people who are not imprisoned anymore in their apartments and in their apartment buildings. The next huge uh, spot was, at least for me, surprisingly, Italy. Who would have thought that would be the case. And I am smack in the middle of the epicenter of uh, the pandemic in Bergamo. Uh, today's episode is not dedicated to that, but uh, you can read about my experience uh, online. I wrote a post about it. And the things that uh, the Italians implemented first um, just um, some recommendations, then closing the schools, then uh, uh, lockdown in specific areas, and then extending uh, lockdown to all of the country. And uh, as I am recording this, debating whether they should deploy uh, the army across the country in order to make people comply more strictly with, uh, with the recommendations, or with the requirements, rather, with the, with the decrees and the orders, uh, is, um, of course, how the, the country evaluated that, uh, that they should handle the, the situation. An important difference, I believe, and, and we will learn more about this, is that the nurses and the doctors in China slept at their hospitals. In Italy, nurses and doctors go home. And I don't have data 
on the infection rate of their family members, but a very large number, even as a percentage of the total infected of the healthcare workers are positive. To the point, and I have uh, first-hand information of this from a relative, that they are not testing the asymptomatic healthcare workers anymore, which is a very, very ambiguous decision. So, for example, in South Korea, as well as in Singapore and Taiwan, they have been able to tackle the infection rate because of how extensively they are both testing the asymptomatic, not only the uh, explicitly ill, who show fever or coughing or other symptoms, but also because of how they are then tracking the contacts uh, through mobile phones, uh, through uh, QR codes, through all kinds of efficient digital systems that these people have had with others in their place of work, in their um, place of residence, and other communities. Now, the necessary adaptation and evolution that we must be able to incorporate in our lives uh, is quite extreme. Uh, for many, just the fact that they cannot leave their apartment can be complicated. That uh, they are sharing with people they hopefully love, but still it is very different from uh, the previous way of interacting where they uh, would um, have breakfast, go to work, come back, have dinner, to being together 24 hours a day. And of course, many of us cannot resist, but to be almost obsessively up to date in what is going on. I was saying it first, if we must learn, then we cannot ignore. And not ignoring exposes you to the burden psychologically of what is happening all around. In my case here in Bergamo, none of my closest family is sick, but I have relatives of friends who not only are sick, but who died. And it makes a huge psychological difference. The ability to empathize, to show social cohesion, altruism, are all tested. And of course, businesses are also in a very difficult situation. They have to decide if they must send their workers home because even in Italy today, those who uh, have to go to work can go to work. Or uh, the business owners or the, uh, the, the leadership of the business has to decide to tell their workers to stay home and run the risk of not having a business when things uh, pick up again. I will talk in another episode more in detail about the dynamics of complex uh, systems in this sense, but think about it. Already it is predicted that uh, by uh, May 2020, unless governments support them, each airline will go bankrupt. And this kind of state aid would have been prohibited under normal rules, but now it will be certainly allowed because if we let the airline as a legal entity go bankrupt, you could say, well, that's fine. Um, in six months time or a year's time, whenever it is, somebody will put in the necessary money to restart the airline 
and the planes will still be there. The airports uh, will still be there. And when people start flying again, it will be all right. But that is not necessarily the case because, just as an example, pilots will have found other jobs outside of the industry. And some of them will be able to return and eager to do so, but a lot won't. And as a consequence, before the airlines are able to operate as they did before, they could, as an extreme, need to train a new generation of pilots. Now, this is true in terms of uh, adaptation uh, for me as well. Um, an important part of my income has been coming uh, from uh, speaking as a keynote speaker at conferences. And all of these conferences have been cancelled, obviously. So my question to myself was, what do I provide in terms of value as a speaker? I am not an entertainer. I am not a comedian. Uh, so how much is the physical presence that is providing value? And if this is true, that it is not the physical presence, then it must be also true that I should be able to organize the delivery of this value remotely to both companies and governments that uh, have already been paying you, paying me, uh, as well as to uh, individuals. And from an individual's point of view, of course, uh, the availability of uh, Patreon uh, allows each of you to recognize the value that you are receiving and support me uh, uh, by becoming a patron. Uh, and in terms of companies, uh, I am structuring uh, paid online events that uh, various uh, types of organizations are going to be able to uh, uh, take advantage of in order to um, receive the, the value uh, that I am, I am providing and in order to be able to interact. Uh, this is going to be different from um, just listening to a keynote. One of the things that I am planning, for example, is to provide uh, a specific uh, video um, about a theme that we agree just to that particular client so that they can watch it at their leisure and then a week later organize an interactive Q&A session dedicated to them uh, which we prepare in advance uh, with uh, those internal champions that uh, uh, have uh, agreed to, to, to this process and taking for granted that uh, all the participants took the time needed to uh, watch the video, uh, we will hit the ground running. We will be able to just jump into uh, questions that too often actually uh, in the uh, conferences uh, where I used to physically go are cut short. The people who have listened to me have many, many more questions that we are, than we are able to, to answer in the uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, that uh, remain after the keynote, before the next speaker comes on, on stage. Now, there is a lot uh, that needs to be still understood about uh, this process, of course. And uh, I am not the only one uh, going through this, and uh, there is a lot of people uh, posting uh, ideas and information, organizing already uh, various types of, uh, of experiences, experiments, and documenting their outcomes. So one of the things that I decided also to do is to start live streaming. Uh, I have never had a, had a live stream uh, except maybe 10 years ago when I would be live streaming uh, some stuff uh, on platforms that 
maybe don't even exist anymore. More than 10 years ago, I think uh, I, I did the first live streams in 2008 or 2007. And uh, I uh, will be live streaming on a daily basis. I started the, the zeroth uh, episode of uh, what I decided to call Searching for the Question Live um, just a few days ago. And I am uh, uh, structuring it in order to allow for the co-creation of both the platform as well as the content interactively with, with all of you. Uh, I will be talking about the very tools in terms of software and hardware uh, that I am using uh, in my own uh, study slash studio. A very naturally self-reflective, um, uh, uh, self-referential. And, and this is valuable too. Uh, the tools are constantly evolving. The degree with which we are able to uh, take advantage of the tools uh, varies based on our dedication, but also some uh, knowledge that others may have and, and somebody stumbled upon and they are ready to share it. I will also be talking about my experience uh, with COVID-19. And uh, hopefully this is not going to be a long series within the live stream because uh, on one hand my experience stops and uh, I am not ill and I am not planning to be ill and if I were probably I wouldn't have the physical f uh, strength uh, to, to do the live streams but also because I hope the epidemic will be resolved and uh, we'll see the third component uh, of uh, the live stream is going to be, of course, about the themes that are so close to my past experience and, and interests around exponential technologies, around jolting technologies whose acceleration is increasing, around network society and decentralization of how these technologies give rise to a new social economic organization and what the phase transformation that uh, this will require represents from the point of view of our lives, of our communities and of the nations and countries that we are residents of. I will also be setting up new Patreon tiers. You will be able to uh, both join Patreon at the current uh, tier of $5 uh, per month, even though I want to highlight this is a suggested amount. If you want to join Patreon uh, at $1 a month, you can do that too, or 2 or 3 or 4 or 10 And uh, the higher amounts will represent and invite new ways of uh, interacting uh, with me, dedicated uh, to those who not only want uh, to support, but also want to uh, invest. Invest not only or not as much their money, but invest their time, their dedication, their attention. And that is where the co-creation part, I think, is important, because just as I have been already transcribing the context episodes and the transcriptions are available to, to uh, patrons, I will be transcribing the live streams as well. And uh, we will be collecting and highlighting uh, links and uh, tips and tricks and uh, experiences and so on. Now, the context uh, has been uh, going on for almost a year now with uh, over 30 episodes between the two seasons and I am very very proud of it and I am planning to keep uh, doing it. Of course the new experiment of the live stream 
is uh, very different in terms of the rhythm, in terms of uh, how I can and have to prepare. And um, luckily, uh, it is not like uh, in uh, traditional programming uh, where you must fill a given amount of time. You cannot be either shorter or longer. The type of uh, programming uh, that we all enjoy today allows for a non-linear production as well as a non-linear consumption of content. What that means is that, yes, I will start at a given time every day, 7 p.m. CT, which currently, and for another week, I think, or less, is 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And then the, the six hours between uh, Europe and uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, East Coast and nine hours with the U.S. West Coast will reestablish themselves as um, the uh, uh, summer daylight savings time uh, is established in both continents. So I will start at that time and then go for half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour. We'll see. I will also want others to participate. So please, um, if you are interested or curious, um, either uh, offer yourself as a guest, say, I would like to join, or why don't you indicate who would like, who would you like uh, to have uh, on searching for the question live as a, a guest uh, to, to talk together? So I think that's it uh, for today. I am uh, excited, even under the current circumstances, about how we can enhance our understanding of the value of collective intelligence as we collaborate and, and uh, refine the tools and plan for desired outcomes. And I'm looking forward to your inputs, to your questions, to your participation, both uh, in the context as well as in our new experiment, searching for the question live. Thank you.